Welcome to the Aerospace Advantage podcast. I'm your host, John Slickbaum. Here on the Aerospace Advantage, we speak with leaders in the DoD, industry, and other subject matter experts who explore the intersection of strategy, operational concepts, technology, and policy when it comes to air and space power. So if you like learning about aerospace power, you are in the right place. To our regular listeners, welcome back. And if it's your first time here, thank you so much for joining us. As a reminder, if you like what you're hearing today, do us a favor and follow our show. Please give us a like and leave a comment so that we can keep charting the trajectories that matter to you most. All right, this week, it's time for The Rendezvous again, which is our monthly installment where the Mitchell team digs into stories that you've heard and seen in the headlines. So this time around, we've got General David Deptula, sir. Welcome to the show. Yeah, great to be here, folks. All right, we also have Todd Sledge Harmer with us. Great to be here, Slit. And also Anthony Laser Lazarski. Great to be back. All right, and Laser and Sledge, for those who are new to the rendezvous, are our Washington experts who have been part of the show for a long time, and they bring tremendous insight, so we're really going to lean on them this week. All right, and then we also have Doug Berkey from the Mitchell team. Hey, it's like great to see you. All right, and then adding, we've got Charles Galbraith from the Mitchell Institute Space Power Center of Excellence. It's like great to be here. All right, now, Doug, before we get started with the big conversation today, I want to turn the mic over to you just for a minute. You bet, man. Thanks. I just wanted to bring everybody's attention to the fact that we've got an opening right now for a senior fellow for air power studies. It's pretty rare that we've got one of these openings. This is a really unique opportunity to join the Mitchell team, and the senior fellows are the real engines of the operation here. They're the ones that come up with the policy positions, do the research, the writing, and are the faces around town really helping that change on these issues. So if you're interested, reach out to us on our website, and we'd love to talk to you about it, but these are really the heart and soul of Mitchell, these positions. So look forward to chatting with any of you that are interested. Yeah, hey, let me add my two cents. General Deptula here. There is no other organization in the world, and I mean that literally, that is like Mitchell Institute. We're a family. We're beholden to no one other than what we believe is in the best interest in the United States military. And we're passionate about how to exploit the virtues and values of airspace and cyber power. So if you're interested in being part of this family, let us know and give us a call. Awesome, sir. And then just one quick pile on. I have to emphasize, just like you said, joining the Mitchell team as a senior fellow at that level is a really big deal. And there are not many places in the world where you can help shape the future of air power at this level. So with that, Laser and Sledge, let's get started with the headlines first, the debt ceiling negotiations. The headlines are filled with potential agreement between the Democrats and Republicans. So what exactly are the issues in play and what could this mean for defense? And let's start at the 101 level and then work through the details as best we know them. Sure. And I'll start with good news. There's issues, obviously, with the agreement, especially how it impacts defense. But the good news is Congress is going to pass this debt ceiling increase, this bill that raises the debt ceiling. It passed out of House rules. You'll see tonight, starting at 830, the House will vote. They'll be done by 930 and they'll get it over to the Senate. Uh, We expect the Senate to have the 60 votes needed to pass. However, it could get strung out because of a couple of members of the Senate that want to slow the process down. So I'm not sure exactly when it will pass, but expect it to be done potentially by the 5th or earlier, which is what they're calling X date. And that's a fluctuating date based on numbers. But right now, if you look, the debt ceiling is at $31.4 trillion. We're about to exceed that. Our government has raised the debt ceiling 78 times, and it's just allowing us, if we don't, if Congress doesn't do this, we go into fall. So Congress has gone ahead and will raise the debt ceiling. And along with it, what they've done is get a two-year budget agreement. And that's where it starts impacting defense. Because the increase for defense, the budget for next for this year as it comes up is 886. And it's a roughly a 3.3% increase. And that basically cuts the overall purchasing power of the Department of Defense, cuts it for the Air Force. So while it is an increase of 3.3%, 
If you look at inflation, if you look at increased operating costs, if you look at increased fuel costs, if you look at increased personnel costs, ability to buy weapon systems, this is going to negatively impact what we can do as an Air Force, what we can purchase as an Air Force. And right now, I know that the Hill is going back through the bills and figuring out, okay, what can we afford and what we what can we afford as they start building the FY24 appropriation and authorization bills. I've got to ask you this one. So how is this different than past crises we've seen, like sequestration and the Budget Control Act of 2011? Well, I'll jump in first on this one. I think there are a lot of similarities between the two, even though they're 12 years removed. Um, I think most importantly, they share the same origin story. And by that, we're approaching a fiscal cliff. We need to raise the debt limit there to resolve the deficit spending and continue the legislative process. Also, as in 2011, currently the Democrats control the White House and the Senate, and you have the Republicans in charge of the House. So that's a dynamic that we have to be very mindful of as we watch this kind of go through the machine. There are also some very significant differences between the Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2023, as it's being called, and the Budget Control Act of 2011. And Laser and I know I lived through this working on the Hill in the Senate back then. That was a 10-year plan to reduce deficit spending. And basically, the Budget Control Act was a ra- raised the debt ceiling $900 billion, but it was offset by $917 billion in spending cuts. So there was no need to raise additional revenue, and it was by design a deficit reduction bill. There were three mechanisms in the Budget Control Act that were significant. First was there was a joint select committee on deficit reduction, and their job was to recommend legislation that would reduce the deficit spending going forward. The second required Congress to vote on a balanced budget amendment that could have been included into the Constitution. And then the third part, and you mentioned it slick there, there was a mechanism, an enforcement mechanism in the Budget Control Act called sequestration. And if Congress failed to meet the budget restrictions that were in each of the tranches per fiscal year, then the sequester would come in and take a automatic 10% cut across all the appropriations accounts. So that was the the instrument of fear to get Congress to work. Contrasting that with the Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2023, it's a two-year agreement, as Laser had mentioned earlier. It raises the debt ceiling through January of 25, so into the next administration past the 2024 elections there. Laser hit on the top line for defense, but also the Department of Veterans Affairs, $121 billion, which is consistent with the president's budget request. And then the non-defense discretionary, the rest of the discretionary money is going to be funded at $637 billion, which is basically on par with the FY23 budget numbers. So that's the breakout in what the discretionary spending is. There is a punitive enforcement mechanism in this legislation, and really it, it basically says if Congress doesn't pass all 12 appropriations bills by the end of the calendar year, then those top line numbers are taken off the table and there's an automatic 1% decrease in spending. So that's to force Congress into an appropriations bill. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. The second year, and I know we're going to talk a lot more about this later on here, the FY25 numbers across the board for discretionary spending are raised by 1%. That's all. So we're going to go from 886 to about 895 in fiscal year 25 for defense spending. And uh, assuming that inflation is not going to be less than 1%, that reflects a real cut in purchasing power going forward. And then although there was intent to go beyond those two years, there really is no enforceable or enforcing mechanism in the the years from uh, 26 to 29. That's kind of where we are in comparing the two. And it's really too early to tell how this is going to play out in the next week or two. But I think if you drive by the National Archives and you see the Bill Shakespeare quote passed his prologue, I think you can go back to 2011 and look. That bill was passed. There were a lot of people on the far left and the far right in in 2011 that were upset with the legislation, so they voted against it. I think you're going to see that again. It will pass, and I think it will be with a fairly healthy uh, majority, but it will be bipartisan. So you'll see a significant number of Republicans and Democrats in both the House and Senate vote for it. And then to throw another quote out there, our friend Clausewitz, he said, nothing in war is final and the same is true with budget agreements. In the years after the Budget Control Act, there were several adjustments to those spending cuts. There was the American Taxpayer Relief Act of 2012. There was a Bipartisan Budget Act of 2013, which was also known as the Ryan Murray Budget Agreement, that adjusted the top lines. 
So I think it's probably safe to assume that there's going to be some of that that happens after this bill gets passed. But I think the bottom line is we cannot afford, and I mean that in a literal and figurative sense, a repeat of the Budget Control Act. In 2011, defense spending, which was about 18% of U.S. government spending, took 50% of the cuts. The U.S. Air Force has still not recovered from the readiness hole that was created by the Budget Control Act. And I know that even though defense spending was largely untouched in the Fiscal Responsibility Act of 2023, we cannot afford to see history repeat itself. Only thing I'd add on and agree 100% with everything the Sledge said is, as he said, we've modified. We didn't fully go through sequestration, but it still hit the Air Force DOD bad. But we also had OCO, Overseas Contingency Operations Funding, and that was helping offset some very small portion, but some of the impacts. We don't have OCO. We don't have GWAT. So now looking is what is Congress going to do? We've got increased expenditures for what we're doing in Ukraine to include all the equipment that we're we're providing them. How do we backfill that equipment? How is that paid for? How is increased operations that we're doing in Indo-PACOM and additional operations now that we have to do in CENTCOM? So that's something I think they may be looking at. I haven't heard any word on a supplemental. They've been, people don't talk about supplementals or any type of OCO or GWAP, but that could be something to look at in the future. Roger that, guys. And, you know, defense was in a different place back when we were talking about 2011. We were involved in Afghanistan and Iraq, but, you know, I don't think a lot of Americans consider those conflicts to be like we're fighting existential threats compared to what us at the Mitchell family are talking about here. We believe Chinese aggression in the Pacific and Russia's invasion of Ukraine are far graver, not to mention Iran, North Korea, and a lot more actors that are starting to rise up. Do you think these negotiations factored what's at stake in that context and the reality that the U.S. is the defense establishment is in the middle of a crucial reset, it's notable that defense appears to be spared major cuts, but it just wasn't that way in 2011. I'd say absolutely. Of course, I get a little scared. If this wasn't happening, how bad would defense have been cut if there wasn't a threat out there? You know, we have to thank China for everything they're doing around the world, Indo-PACOM. Our allies are looking at the United States. United States is looking at what it needs to do in Indo-PACOM. Russia has woken Europe up, both Eastern Europe and Western Europe up. And so now they're looking at working with the United States. We're looking at what we need to do there. And the same thing, North Korea, every time they shoot up a missile, which they just tried to shoot up another satellite, which landed in the ocean somewhere. And then Iran, every time we look to, quote, pivot out of the Middle East, Iran or one of our other little problem neighbors out there will do something like take a couple of ships and then we have to increase presence. So, yes, that's factored into it. I've listened to the different members of Congress. And and like we said earlier, the defense hawks out there, even with all this going on, do not agree with this bill. Graham came out and said it's putting our defense capabilities at serious risk. Collins and Wicker, so vice chair of the Senate Appropriations Committee, Wicker ranking member on the Armed Services, and Mike Rogers, chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, all opposed President Biden's FY24 budget, which is essentially what's coming over in this bill, calling it inadequate based on the rising global threat. So yes, while that has all impacted it, it hasn't impacted enough to where we should actually be increasing defense spending more. I think the only thing I would add to that, Slick, is just maybe to put an exclamation point on what Laser just said there. Capability and capacity required sustained enduring investment. And if you want to have first-rate airspace and cyber forces, you've got to, you've got to pay for it. And uh, that's the reality of it. Yeah, I've got a little bit different take. My perspective is that the short answer to the question is no. The debt limit negotiations did not factor into the degree required, and I think that's what Laser concluded, but it didn't factor into the degree required what's at stake given the reality that the U.S. defense establishment is in the middle of a crucial reset. Now, as Laser did state, when taken into consideration the reality of inflation, this bill actually results in a cut in U.S. military spending. Here's the crux of the problem. The size and the capabilities of the U.S. military in general, and the Air Force in particular, were significantly reduced over the past three decades by short-term budget choices, not long-term strategy. And this agreement continues that trend. As a result of these decisions, the Air Force today is the oldest and the smallest in its history, and given its continued underfunding, it's now on track to get even smaller in the future. 
Uh, politicians keep saying that we're the best military force in the world, but they seem to ignore the fact that the combat air forces we have today are less than half the size they were when we won in Desert Storm in 1991. It's questionable if we even have the capacity to fight and win just one major regional contingency today when our national defense strategy highlights the need to both deter and, if necessary, defeat aggression by a major power and deter opportunist aggression elsewhere. Then it goes on to cite both China and Russia as pure antagonists with additional two lesser regional contingencies that could pop up any time, North Korea and Iran. Now, from a strategic perspective, What's at play here is that the capacity of the United States to deter conflict has significantly eroded over the past 30 years. And that's part of why Putin decided to invade Ukraine. He sensed weakness on the part of the United States, and he's taking advantage of that weakness. So the Russian action should be a wake-up call to rebuild the U.S. military. But here's the problem. Defense as an issue was not a topic in the 2016, 2020, 2022, nor run up to the 2024 elections. So I think there's been a failure by the Congress and by extension the American people to understand the gravity of the threats facing the United States today and that are growing stronger by the day. Today's national defense strategy requires an Air Force that's sized and equipped to deter China. Let me remind people, that's a nation more than four times as populous as ours from risking a fight with the United States. Yet today's Air Force simply doesn't have the capacity to do so, and this budget and the follow-on plans don't have the necessary funding in them required to reverse the dangerous decline that the United States Air Force is in. General Deptula talked about the steady decline of the Air Force over the past three decades. The Space Force doesn't have that luxury. We've only existed for four years. And in that four years, we've grown considerably. But a potential delay in the funding of new efforts to get after the threats that General Deptula talked about from China and Russia limit the Space Force's ability to develop a resilient architecture and develop capabilities to deter China's aggression in space. General Saltzman talked about it in his testimony that not getting this through potentially drives the Space Force back to 2022 levels, so that we were basically half the Space Force we are today. The capabilities that we need include counter space capabilities that are new. There are seven new start programs that are at risk of future delays, and we're trying to stand up a new service here, and every time Congress delays giving the services the funding that they need, it basically rides the clutch on a, on a car, and we're going to stall out. We've got to be able to maintain consistent funding and continued growth. A steady state and, and factoring in inflation that goes actually in the wrong direction is absolutely the opposite of what the Space Force needs to grow to be the service that it has to be to help deter conflict. We've seen Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the use of cyber and RF weapons to try to deny the Ukrainians access to space. We absolutely have to assume that in a conflict with the United States, they're going to do that and more. Both China and Russia have demonstrated RF, cyber, laser, and co-orbital threats. So our space systems are in a very precarious position. We built our architecture based on assuming that space was a relatively safe environment. We've recognized that was a false assumption, and we're taking active steps to try to increase the resilience of our overall or overall architecture, but we can't do that if we don't get the funding that we need to make those changes. Now, Charles, that's really well said. And why did we create a Space Force if we're not willing to resource it to do the job that's required in a job that's fundamentally changed really fast? And I think the other point I want to highlight here is that the Air Force took a pause on modernization in the 90s, the 2000s, and 2010s. It was all premised on modernization in the 2020s, which required ramped funding. So if we cut out that tranche of cash, you are now extending for a fourth decade very suboptimal modernization that just doesn't hack it. And that's how we get to things like gapping fighters at Kadena, where we literally just don't have enough new jets to backfill ones that are so old they have to be retired. It's going to cascade 
throughout units around the country. So how are we going to pay for KC-46s, F-35s, B-21s, CCAs, the replacement for search and rescue helicopters, T-70, you name it. You either backfill these with something new or you sunset the mission. And without the cash increase, it, it doesn't happen. There isn't enough to get there from here. Yeah, Doug, I mean, you just brought up a point. I don't think we've really wrapped our minds around the fact that we don't have a permanent or we're planning on not having a permanent party air superiority squadron or squadrons in Kadena. So that we'll let that sink in for a second. But I want to go around the table on this one. We've seen the Air Force and the Space Force leadership testify at posture hearings. Any thoughts on the major messages that they've delivered and the issues members are choosing to prioritize? It's a great question, Slick. I think Secretary Kendall's first budget built entirely under his direction does a fine job of underwriting necessary Air Force and Space Force capabilities. But the demands on the Air Force still far exceed the resources that has been allocated. Today, it simply does not have the capacity to execute the nation's defense strategy. So if the Department of the Air Force's plans are going to have a chance for success, its continued underfunding must be reversed. Let's give the audience a bit of background and remind folks that the FY24 budget is the 31st year in a row that the Air Force budget is less than that of the Army and the Navy. And that's why the Air Force today is the oldest and the smallest it's ever been in its history. Because of this continued underfunding, the Air Force is being forced to retire more aircraft in FY24 and for the next five years than they're acquiring. No mission can tolerate this. However, the biggest threat to the Air Force is not the Chinese or the Russians. It's the pass-through. The over $44 billion in the Air Force budget that does not go to the Air Force, but makes it appear to U.S. citizens, members of Congress, the Department of Defense, and the administration leadership that the Air Force is the highest funded of all the services because that's what the numbers reflect. But in fact, among the Navy, Army, Air Force, and defense-wide programs, the Air Force is in last place. Now, Senator Tom Cotton raised this issue with the Secretary of the Air Force directly asking him if he was aware that the pass-through hides the fact that the Air Force is not receiving the budget that it appears to be. He also asked the Secretary if he was aware that the Army received $1.3 trillion more than the Air Force in the 20 years post 9-11, and that the Navy received a trillion dollars more evidencing concerns about the impact of the pass-through as well as other decisions that have resulted in such a small Air Force. The SECAF responded that he was not aware of this and that he was happy with the president's budget. The bottom line is the Air Force won't get the resources necessary to stop the dangerous decline in its force structure unless its own leadership makes the case for the resources necessary to reverse its dramatic force structure decline and the vector that it's on to get even smaller. So on the Space Force side, we've been asking for money, and so far we've been getting additional funding to, to grow the mission. One of the congressmen said basically the whole Space Force is a new start, emphasizing the criticality of getting funding approved because you can't start a new start effort without the budget <coughs> approval because you're leveraging the previous year's funding levels. So any growth in the Space Force is absolutely dependent on the passing uh, of a budget in a timely manner. It delays, continuing CRs that, that go well into the fiscal year really hinder the development of new efforts. We talked about some major themes that have occurred during these hearings. Certainly the CR or the debt ceiling limit was the major one and members referred to it as devastating. And that's absolutely true. A couple other things that were pertinent from the Space Force perspective, questions revolved around national security launch and how imperative it was to maintain a robust launch infrastructure as well as competition for launch services. And the Space Force has got to be able to uh, cultivate the commercial community, so to speak, to, to make sure that we have viable options for launch services, but also, and, and most importantly, to assure that those launches are successful for the critical national security payloads. 
There's varying levels of risk that we can accept depending upon the type of mission, but assured access to space is the fundamental precept of all of our space activities. As General Salzman referred to it, it's basically the runway. Without it, the aircraft can't get off the ground. Spacecraft can't get into orbit. So the criticality of national security launch was emphasized. A few other areas were the adoption of commercial capabilities for services and partnering, as well as for launch capabilities as well. Partnership to, to make up where the Space Force TOA can't cover all the things we need to do to ensure that we provide a cohesive fight going forward of space capabilities. Yeah, just to follow up, Charles, and talk about risk, General Deptula was saying it is correct. And the way I've, we've heard it in the past is, okay, we support the budget. However, it's going to increase risk or we have to accept more risk. Air Force and Space Force's leadership did a great job coming over. I thought the back and forth between members of the different defense committees and our Air Force leadership went well. They, were, they did a good job highlighting Russia and China, need for modernization, global ISR, space launch, as Charles just talked about. And they talked about the size of the force and impact on sustained operations. I thought the questions back from the members digging into it, not, not wholeheartedly, supporting the budget that came over from the president. Again, I thought the give and take went well. And also to follow up on General Deptula, besides having a hearing, open hearing and televise the meetings that go on between the different members and our different leadership at the Department of Defense and the Air Force behind closed doors. They can get into some of the additional details and how much risk we're going to we're accepting, as well as some of the classified briefs. But I think that's something that needs to be highlighted more while we support a budget. It does significantly increase the risk, which is what everybody's been talking about. The only way problems are going to get solved is if a real issue is highlighted, a problem statement. And that has to be very clear at that level of communication. I would suggest that could have been more pointed in a lot of cases. There are times when I think, I get it, they're senior officials and they're in those jobs, but they can say, this is what I've been allocated and this is what I can buy. However, this is really where the demand requirement is and in between is risk. And I think that could have been a little bit more pointed in some areas. Sledge Laser, uh, given the budget top line negotiations, the defense committees are pausing on holding their uh, markup. So can you walk us through the process and what the delays will likely mean for the bills? Yeah, I think nothing really is going to happen until they have an agreement on the debt ceiling. But then this has all the markings of a great car chase movie. It's going to be fast and furious. Um, if you take a look at the calendar, what really, for all intents and purposes, the debt ceiling debate has put the Congress at least a full month behind schedule. There's only nine legislative weeks left until the end of the fiscal year, so there's not a lot of time. And in theory, we would start with the subcommittees, they would mark up their bills, and it would go to the full committee for their marks and amendments. Then it would go to the floor, and once it's off the floor and both chambers are done, it would go to a conference committee to reconcile the differences. I think in reality, you're going to see Corners cut, maybe some amendments to procedures to get things done quickly. It looks like the first full week in June, so somewhere around the 6th and the 7th, the House Armed Service Committee subcommittees will do their markups. That'll be the first shoe to drop. I know some of the House Appropriations subcommittees have already done their markups, but they'll need to be readjusted there for the new top-line numbers. And then we're looking at full committee marks, and I'm hearing Something to the effect, around the 21st of June, you will have the HASC full committee, you'll have the SASC subcommittees and full committees in the same week, and then you'll have the House Defense Appropriations Committee marking their bills all on or about the 21st of June. It's going to be very fast, and there's going to be a lot of activity there. How I see this playing out in the future, I, again, I think there's going to be very similar to what we've seen in the past several years. Nothing major is going to get passed until December when we have the National Defense Authorization Act, followed shortly by some type of an omnibus bill that will carry the 12 appropriations bills. But I will also throw a warning out there. A lot of the debt ceiling drama here is creating scar tissue on the far left and the far right. And it's going to be tough in the House to get to 218 and tough in the Senate to get to 60 to pass legislation. Remains to be seen, you know, how much support will waver for passing a bill. But there are whispers that this year that Congress will be unable to pass a policy bill. So that would be the first time in over 63 years we haven't had a Defense Authorization Act. And then there are rumors uh, or whispers, to be more appropriate, that the government would be funded under a full year continuing resolution. 
Uh, I would say lack of either bill would be devastating, and both lack of both bills would be catastrophic for defense and industry. I'll be a little more optimistic than Sledge. First of all, he's right. There's six weeks between now and the August recess of in-session time, and they've got more to do than they have time. So every bill, if we're trying to do regular order and everything that Sledge said is true, and we've got the House Armed Services Committee, the Senate Armed Services Committee, we need to mark up both of them in June, and then we need to try to get them to the floor in July. But then at the same time, we have Senate appropriators and House appropriators, and we're trying to get 12 bills through, try to get them to the floor and try to get everything done before the August recess, which is not going to happen. But I think they're going to try to get as many done as they can. And then as we would hope, they would try to do some sort of conference. And I'm going to stay optimistic. I think both the House and the Senate authorizers will get their bills done before the August recess if they can get floor time. And at least they can start working their bills together. And I'll be optimistic that they get it done by December also. The appropriations bills, I think they'll get a handful done, and then they'll try to pick it up in September when they come back and then try to work some sort of, they want to get back to normal order. That's what they keep saying. I think it'll be some version in between what we've been doing lately with omnibuses that you read the day prior and then back to normal order. But that's what the chairs and the vice chairs of the appropriations committee have been saying. One thing to throw in there is we all know that General Brown has been nominated to be the next chairman of the Joint Chiefs. So we have nomination hearings that we have to get through. We have chief of naval operations. We have Marine Corps Commandant. We have chairman of the Joint Chiefs. We have chief of staff of the Air Force, we have cyber, we have the other COCOMs, and that has all got to get built into this schedule. So Congress is going to have their hands full all the way up to the August recess. And then, as I said, we're already behind, so we'll be into another CR, and I'm going to stay hopeful that we get all these bills done right around Christmas time so that we can go into the FY25 cycle. Yeah, thanks for all that, gentlemen. Doug, I want to bring you in here because Congressman Bacon introduced legis- legislation that focuses on the Air National Guard fighter force. So can you walk us all through what's in play here? Because there's a lot. Now you bet. It's very important. And it's something we talk about a lot. Bottom line, what the bill tries to do is preserve the Air National Guard fighter force structure that exists today from a capacity perspective. Not necessarily those exact tails, but the numbers in play. And this is really important. Remember what I said about Kadena earlier. The Air Force literally did not have jets available to backfill aircraft that were retiring because they were just so old they had to be retired. During the Reagan administration, for multiple years, the Air Force acquired around 200 fighters a year. The Air Force has struggled to get up to 72 this year. We've been well below that for many years, so the math just doesn't add. The Reagan administration was multiple decades ago, nearing 40 years, and that iron is done. And so if we're not buying enough to backfill, that we're really going to see a capacity death spiral fall out this decade. And so something has to happen as a forcing function. It shouldn't be active duty versus guard. This is a total Air Force problem. What this is premised on is additive funding to boost fighter buys writ large. And that's the kind of solution that's required. That's going to be really hard given the budget factors we're just talking about now. But if we don't do this, you're going to see not just aircraft full off, but the pilots, the maintainers, the entire enterprise. That takes years and years to regenerate. And when something like the Ukraine conflict kicks off or something happens in the Pacific, you don't have that time. And I don't know how we choose in this world between deterring Putin or China or a pop-up in the Middle East or the Homeland Defense Mission. I don't know how you make those choices because they all have to be done. They all require fighters. And when you deferred buys, For 30 years, this is where you're at. you got to make it up all at once. It's very hard. It does require additive funding. I think where we really have to look is back within the budget build itself. There are trades that can be made within the services or between the services to plus this up. And I think it's important to highlight, you don't have joint power unless you have air power. And that air superiority element is so crucial. And so people need to think very seriously about that. But the guard is baked in as a core part of capacity now. We've got to steward it, but active duty is there right with it. Those aircraft are also old. It's all got to be taken care of, and it has to be taken care of this decade. The old iron will not last any longer. Yeah, well said. Uh, Anybody else want to hop in on this topic? I'll just reiterate the points that Doug made and also go back to what I said at the beginning. The Air Force has a capacity issue, and it needs to be reversed. The Air National Guard is a part of the total force. 
So they're an integral portion in making our Air Force whole again. The appropriate actions need to be taken, and the Guard is a key part of those actions. Yeah, I've got to ask the laser and sledge. What do you think it'll take for this to gain momentum? You've seen things up close and personal in the offices and on committee. A lot of states are really being impacted by this, but is it enough to move the needle? That's a great question. I think that, and unfortunately, it, my fear is it'll take an event to wake us up, to realize that we don't have the assets that we need. I mean, we're not seeing that. And going back to Congressman Bacon, Great American continues to do what others have done, trying to preserve our Air Force, our capabilities to execute our missions. Some have said it's parochial. And what's great about what Congressman Bacon has done, he doesn't have a National Guard unit, so you can't say it's parochial. But yet, if one of the other members were saying, I want to protect another asset, so they would say it's parochial if they have in the States. But what I've found, and I think Sledge would agree, is it's not parochial. What they're trying to do is ensure that we have a military, an Air Force, that can do do the missions that our nation is requiring it to do. And it's not just this is about the Guard, but this is more than the Air National Guard. Matter of fact, if you look at what Bacon says, he says, I think the capacity is going to get too small to deal with China, plus Europe and the presence in other areas. He says, I don't mind disinvesting. I don't mind getting rid of the A-10, but to do it on a two-to-one rate doesn't make sense. We put in 2017 in the NDAA, we put floors on for assets, particularly the fighters, 1,800 aircraft. 1145 for primary mission aircraft inventory for fighters. We did that not to be parochial, but to make sure that we don't get too small where we can't do our mission as the Air Force. It goes back to what we started with. We're in a resource constrained environment. We're accepting more risk. And as General Gatula says, we're looking at this death spiral. How do we get out of it? Yeah, I would say, Slick, back to your question, though, about what will it take to gain momentum. I think everyone acknowledges the National Guard is a very powerful constituency. They've got great influence on Capitol Hill. But really, this is going to be how effective the staff is in their outreach on the amendment to get other members on board, because it's really a numbers game to get it to get something across the finish line and get momentum. But I would say, and for lack of a better analogy, this legislation is treating the symptom of the problem and not the disease. And I would rather have Congress first get in the debate of what do we want our reserve component? And when I say reserve, the Air Force Reserve and the National Guard, what do we want our reserve component to do? And once you figure that out, you can right-size the force and procure the capacity you need to satisfy the requirements of the national security strategy. All right, Charles, can you walk us through what we should know from a Hill perspective when it comes to space? We've seen a lot of leaders testifying and members highlighting issues. So what do you think is noteworthy? Thanks, Lick. I talked about a few of them already, the need for developing our counter space capabilities to actually deter aggression from China and Russia in space, a national security space launch. One of the areas, though, that I didn't hit on earlier that I think is really critical, and we've talked a little bit about it in, within the Air Force, and that's the people. What signal are we sending to the current military and civilian workforce of the Space Force and the Air Force and the potential guardians and airmen of the future, when we can't get our budgets approved, when we can't have a consistent growth in areas that we say are critical, but then don't fund them appropriately. And it's not just about the recruitment and the retention, but it's also about the training elements. You know, we've got to provide the right training mechanisms, education for our guardians so that they can prepare for a potential conflict in space. And that's the best way to deter that potential conflict in space. So I think we have to look at the people aspect of all of this as well. Yeah, I totally agree. I want to get to a final question here, and I know that we hit on the F-16 transfer issue really hard in a dedicated episode, but are there any thoughts that this panel wants to bring to share about what's going on with Ukraine with F-16s? Yeah, I'll jump in there and just comment that there are several senior U.S. leaders who are making comments hedging the utility of sending F-16s to Ukraine who should know better. Contrary to these unexperienced remarks, With appropriate numbers, weapons, and training, the F-16 has the potential to be a game changer in repelling Russian aggression. The current limited and restrictive U.S. administration approach simply supports a stalemate. That's an equation that's guaranteed to fail in the long run. On the surface, their strategy centralizes on providing enough equipment for Ukraine not to lose. But given that Ukraine cannot sustain a long-duration conflict, this is a fatally flawed approach. 
and it's very reminiscent of the gradualism and short-sightedness of President Johnson's approach to the Vietnam War. Gradualism didn't work then, and it won't work in Ukraine. The half-hearted and hedging language accompanying the approval of other nations to train and supply F-16s to Ukraine is unimaginative and, quite frankly, very disappointing. Slick Charles here. I'm not going to talk about F-16s because I'm not a pilot. I'm a former guardian, and I will talk about space and some of the lessons learned from the Ukraine conflict. One, we saw Russia use cyber attacks to deny commercial satellite communications to Ukraine. We saw Ukraine pivot to the use of Starlink, a proliferated low-Earth orbit constellation for communications. We've seen Russia try to go after that, but we've seen the resilience of that architecture being able to con- provide continued access to communications for the Ukrainians. So I think this is a great lesson for us to learn and move forward with, but we can't rest there because Russia and China are also learning from this and they're going to develop new capabilities to go after those proliferated assets. And so we can't prepare for the last fight. We've always got to prepare for the next fight and move forward. Over. Yeah, yeah, absolutely agree. Last question here. I just want to get the uh, sledge and laser to hop in on any take on hill developments here. Folks, Must be happy about the F-16s, but there's got to be some frustration that it took us a year to get to a yes. Yeah, there's frustration about the equipment taking too long to get in to get the F-16 decision. But you're right, bipartisan support on the Hill. From what I'm listening to and seeing, the move is seen as a commitment to Ukraine to improve long-term capabilities of the Air Force, which means that we see a future and a future Ukrainian Air Force. The other positive, they're watching European countries come together, the United States working with them, working with the training, getting F-16s for them. And given, General Deptula said this, uh, but given there is no insight that we can see as an end to this war, there's a chance that the Ukrainian F-16 pilots could see combat operation. And this move is all about their future. And the real bottom line is Western equipment, Western training of incredible war fighters in Ukraine are helping Ukraine to retake their country. I'm going to take a slightly different tact, and I want to go back to my previous medical analogy there. I think this whole F-16 debate is, once again, treating the symptom and not necessarily the underlying disease. And, And I think to get to that, Congress really needs to press the administration on the strategy. What does victory look like in Ukraine, and are we willing to support that? And I think that's fundamental to any of the debates of what we send, how we send, and when we send it. This is basic war college stuff. The strategy is connecting your means to your ends. And if we don't know what the end looks like, any place will get us there. Yeah, that, that is a great point. But unfortunately, guys, we are out of time for today. I know we're running a little bit long, but great answers. And I really appreciate everybody participating today. So with that, we're going to sign off. And thanks again to General Deptula, Laser, Sledge, Charles, and Doug. Yeah, you bet, Slick. Good to be here and have a great aerospace power kind of day. Always a pleasure. Same. Thanks, Slick. Hey, thanks, Ed. Take care. With that, I'd like to extend a big thank you to our guests for joining in today's discussion. I'd also like to extend a big thank you to our listeners for your continued support and for tuning in to today's show. If you like what you've heard today, don't forget to hit that like button and follow or subscribe to the Aerospace Advantage. You can also leave a comment to let us know what you think about our show or areas you think we should explore further. As always, you can join in on the conversation by following the Mitchell Institute on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn, and you can always find us at mitchellaerospacepower.org. Thanks again for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stay safe and check six.